What is going on, Alpha Males? Welcome to the Alpha Male Podcast. The podcast where we talk about what it means to be a man the right way, strong, made in the image of God, and don't apologize, making godly men strong, and making strong men godly. Today, a somber topic, but I think one that needs to be addressed. If you listen to Alpha Male Podcast, you're not into survival, into preparedness, into watching and being ready. Maybe give this one a shot anyway. I promise no tinfoil hat, conspiracy theory type stuff. Just common sense. For we are all strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So when is a good time to make your pilgrimage somewhere else? That's what we're going to talk about today. If you've listened to more than one episode, meaning this is not your first episode of Alpha Male Podcast, I'd appreciate it if you subscribed and left a review. It's a free way, monetarily, anyway, for you to support the podcast, and it would be greatly appreciated. A lot of apps have some stars you can scroll down and hit whatever stars, or actually writing a review is even better. Anyway, with that, I'm going to plug in the bio. If you've heard it before or don't care, you can skip around 3 minutes and 45 seconds. That should be about 7 clicks on most apps, little fast-forward thing. And hopefully that will get you close to the main topic. Who am I? A question we should all ask ourselves. I am, first and foremost, a servant of God made in his very own image, a follower of Jesus Christ, a simple man called by God to the Great Commission to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Next, a little bit about my background and what God has allowed me to do and blessed me to do in life. Grew up what most would consider very poor in the backwoods of the southeastern and mid-Atlantic United States. Hunting and fishing. Joined the Marine Corps at 17. Did a couple of combat tours in Iraq. So a decorated Marine Corps combat veteran. Infantry assaultman. After the combat tours... I was an urban warfare instructor for the United States Marine Corps under Mojave Viper. I also served in the U.S. Army, both full-time and part-time National Guard. Also a veteran of law enforcement. I served with LAPD. I was a sworn peace officer, a cop for LAPD. I worked regular patrol assignments and more specialized assignments. One of those more specialized assignments was warrant service, fugitive recovery. Also had some other law enforcement roles. I am an FBI certified firearms instructor and been certified by another three-letter government agency in a lot of firearms and training things. I've also been a private contractor, worked in the private sector, Pertaining to tactics and gunfighting and protecting America from enemies foreign and domestic. I served as the commander of a tactical team to stop active shooters in a large metropolitan area. That was our primary mission to stop active shooters, which sadly are a thing in America today. I've also been blessed to do quite a bit of competition shooting Started my first formal competitions even before joining the Marine Corps at 17. I had won more shooting competitions than I can remember. I have competed in all manner of disciplines in shooting. I've been blessed to be a state rifle and pistol champion. West Coast regional champion. Like I said, been blessed to win more shooting competitions than I can remember. I mentioned hunting. I've hunted to put meat on the table. Starting when I was a child, I've also been a professional big game hunter and guide, hunting and slaying all manner of beast. And I don't apologize for that. 
humbled to be the host of three podcasts, Simple Man Sermons, Alpha Male Podcast, and Gumfighter Life. Obviously, as things not mentioned, I've been blessed to do many other things. But, again, first and foremost, I'm a servant. A servant of God, a believer and follower of the Bible, the Word, Jesus Christ. And I don't apologize for that. With that, let's transition into today's topic. So if you don't know, if you're not a regular listener... My wife and I live semi-nomadically, neo-pioneering, whatever you want to call it. We live mobily. We both can pretty much work from anywhere, praise God for that. So we travel around. Also, you should probably know we actually had to bug out twice last year, this past year. Because we were in Arizona and we had to bug out because of the wildfires. Like literally, emergency evacuation orders given, we literally bugged out. There's a whole episodes on that called Bug Out Actual if you want to listen. Anyway, that's a little bit of backstory I think is germane to today's topic in that we were recently on a road trip again and my wife, she's really close to her family, a lot closer than I am to mine and she really wanted to go and spend some time with her mother and her brother and her nieces and nephews. Or I guess her niece and nephew. Anyway, they are in Florida. I really have no desire to be east of the Mississippi River. Just population density is just way too high. To give you an idea, population density in Florida, the source that I looked at and verify this for yourself, is over 400 people per square mile. The population density in Oregon, which is where we spent a big chunk of this year, is 17 people. Again, 400 and something people per square mile to 17 and some change people per square mile. Think about that as far as a survivability standpoint goes. And I don't think I have to tell you that the world is a lot crazier place than we probably remember in decades past. Supply chain issues, entering a second cold war, perhaps even a hot war with Russia. All kinds of things going on. Who would have thought that Who would have thought that elections may mean civil unrest? But I think it very well may. Anyway, all that being said, I think that's all pretty realistic stuff to talk about. It's not tinfoil hat type stuff. That said, I love my wife. She is a great wife and she loves her family. And I don't want to spend my entire life living on what ifs. So I told her our plan A will go to Michigan for November, see her family that's in Michigan, and then we'll head down to Florida and spend a while there, probably the coldest parts of the winter in Florida, before we decide to head back out west. But in doing that, I asked her if we could talk about some bug out indicators. Now, my wife, I'm very blessed that God has given me stewardship to take care of her. That being said, she is not exactly a survivalist, a prepper, or anything. She did own a gun before I met her. She grew up a city girl, but was trying to do the camping and stuff thing on her own. If you listen, you know that we live big chunks of our existence now off-grid. Again, doing the kind of neo-pioneering kind of lifestyle. That being said, she is very intelligent. Also, I think a big thing is she read, and she recommends this book. I've never actually read it. She says it's good for women to read The Gift of Fear. I trust my wife's recommendation on that. And you might be telling the women in your life, nieces, nephews, daughters, wives, whatever, but as the Bible says, no prophet has honor in his own country. So maybe give them that book, The Gift of Fear, see if they'll read it. She seems to really think that it's important enough for women that they should read it. Okay, we started to go into the rumble strip there, but let's go back into the main course of this episode. Bug out indicators. I told her we should sit down and come up with some actual bug out indicators where if these things happen, we get out of Florida. We go west of the Mississippi. There are very few places east of the Mississippi that might be quasi-decent. The very uninhabited parts of Maine. Yeah, that's really all I can come up with for now. 
Anyway, I think a very rational things we settled on for bug out indicators. And I was talking to the Patreon group this morning. We talk pretty much every day except Sabbath. I rest. But the Patreons, we talk to each other and help each other. Iron sharpens iron. They actually helped me quite a bit yesterday with the podcasts. And I shared the bug out indicators with them. They seem to like them. So I sincerely thank everybody that helps out the podcast in that way. And you should thank them too for a lot of stuff and partially and for encouraging and uplifting to get this podcast episode out. Anyway, without any more delay, let's get into what we talked about for bug out indicators. The first one we talked about gas prices, right? Because we have to get back across the country. Now, I was actually quite a bit more conservative than my wife on this one. She said if gas hits seven dollars a gallon, and I said I think that's pretty likely. Anyway, I I said fifteen dollars a gallon, so we settled in the middle at ten dollars a gallon. Meaning, if gas gets above ten dollars a gallon. We'd have enough money to make it across the country. We wouldn't like it, but we could do it. And why is that an indicator? Because if gas gets that high, most things get shipped at some point by gasoline, food, everything else. So prices on a ton of stuff would be going up, which would be very bad for the economy, I think. And I'm not an economist, but think about that for yourself. Be circumspect. Use common sense. So if gas gets that high... That's a bigger indicator of other things. That's why this is called a bug out indication list. But gas getting that high, and I don't think that's very unrealistic. If gas gets, we settle on $10 a gallon, you might want to make a different rule. But if gas gets above $10 a gallon, that's a decent bug out indicator. The other one is supply chain disruption. And I'm talking major supply chain disruption. Do your own research and verify about the diesel situation right now and about the rail worker situation going on. And it could be neither one of those things. It could be any number of things that interrupt the supply chain. But the inability to easily get basic items. I'm not talking about toilet paper like in COVID, right? I'm talking about actual supply chain disruption at more than a very local level. You know, we're going to Florida. Obviously, if there's a big hurricane, you might not be able to get stuff for a week. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about at least regional supply chain disruption of basic staple goods and services. I'm talking eggs, milk, bread, the, you know, the basics. Again, I'm not talking about toilet paper. I'm not talking about the Bed Bath and Beyond, if that's still a store from back when I used to go to malls and stuff. If they don't have your cucumber, lime, lavender, lotion. I'm talking about basic necessity things. And you can make that list for you. We just come up with a real basic classic one is eggs, milk, bread. You might throw on there flour, sugar, things like that. But if, if things get really hard to get... Meaning like you can't just expect to go to Walmart or go to Winco or go to Kroger, wherever your locality is, right? You can't just expect to go in there and get bread. Or you have to wait in line to get bread. You have to go at a certain time of the week to get bread. That's a that's a bug out indicator for us. And I think a pretty reasonable one that we've settled on. You know, we touched on in another episode, why are cities liberal? The fact that cities are consumers, stuff is produced out in the country. If there are supply chain issues where stuff produced elsewhere can't be brought into cities and you're in a city, you either have to have a massive stockpile of stuff or hope that it's a very short-term disruption or you have to leave. And I didn't come up with this. I got this from Viking Preparedness, someone that I'm a patron to. But he says the two things that will get you after a disaster, and I think he's right on with this, starvation and people behaving badly. If you're in a city or in a high population area, there's supply chain disruptions. There's probably going to be both. Starvation and people behaving badly. They kind of feed off of each other, right? Anyway, with that, we'll move into the next bug out indicator. Because I think that's a nice segue. Civil unrest. 
civil unrest. And I'm not talking small, local, like somebody gets shot by police in that city riots for a day or two. Yeah, that's probably a good indicator to bug out of that city. We're talking about completely leaving the people hive that is the East Coast. So it would have to be at least a regional civil unrest that wasn't acute. Meaning it wasn't just like from one thing that's probably going to go away. You know, I was LAPD if you listen for or even listen to the bio. So I'm not talking about like the Rodney King riots. That's an indicator to get out of that city for sure. I'm not even talking about like the George Floyd riots where it was... A lot of cities throughout the country, but it was an acute thing. I'm talking about widespread endemic situation of civil unrest. Heck, I mean, even when I was LAPD and I was assigned to like the sports events, a lot of times, whether whether it was from winning or losing, they would go a little civil unresty and smash up some cop cars and things like that. That wasn't uncommon. I'm talking about mass civil unrest. Anyway, massive civil unrest. I just did, or I should say I didn't just do it. I just re-put out an episode on civil unrest. I've lived through that before. I was the commander of a tactical team in charge when that stuff was going on. You may listen to that one if you want, if you want more resources. But again, widespread, not going away anytime soon civil unrest violent unjust right because there's a time for righteous anger but violent unjust unstable population the next one world war three actual like actually entering world war three i'm not talking about a skirmish between Russia and Ukraine, I'm talking about it escalates and NATO joins or a bunch of other countries join. Who knows what could happen? Russia invading Poland. I mean, that's kind of how, if you're familiar with world history, when Germany invaded Poland, that kind of kicked off World War II. What if Russia invades Poland? What if a lot of things? I'm not going to pin down how I think it might happen. There could be a ton of things that might happen that cause a bunch of countries to go at war with each other. World War III, right? That's a bug out indicator for sure. And I guess war is always on the table throughout human history. I've certainly spent a big chunk of my life and I've certainly been to war. And I hope that widespread warfare is not a thing because I've seen war up close and personal. I know how nasty and disgusting it can be. I don't want all that human life lost I don't want widows and orphans. But sadly, I'm a man acquainted with war, and I know what that means. So if World War III should start, that's a pretty legit bug-out indicator. You define that however you want. I think I would define it as NATO. Not just issuing some decree or something like that, but actually taking action and actually picking up arms and fighting. Whatever the other side, BRICS, deciding as a whole to go to war. But a hot war. I think we're already in a second Cold War, sadly. For a long time, it seemed like we were getting along a little bit better with the Russians. Now, not so much. Anyway, geopolitics aside, World War III is a bug-out indicator. And hindsight is twenty twenty. Some may look back, who knows, in 20 years and decide that at this point we're already in World War III. I'm talking about a clear indication in the present that we are in a world war. The last one is very somber, but any city in the U.S. getting nuked. <laughs> That's a pretty cut and dry bug out indicator. I don't think I have to expound on that, right? If a city in the U.S. gets nuked, even if we don't know who it is, that's a bug out indicator right there, right? Now, if Russia decides to go full scorched earth on us, bugging out is, is a bad option. The whole point of bugging out versus bugging in is one dramatically increases your survival options. When do you bug out? When it's more likely the bugging out is going to have you survive, right? If you're a survivalist, that's somebody that is specialized in surviving. So you bug out when it gives you a greater chance of survival. If a U.S. city gets nuked, 
and you're not immediately in the fallout area because then you got to bug in, right? And if Russia or China decides to nuke the U.S., they're probably going to nuke a bunch of cities, in which case we got to bug in for a while because of radiation and fallout. But if one, let's say D.C., gets nuked, then we bug out. Although I'd hate to be east of the Mississippi River if a bunch of U.S. cities did get nuked. If you don't know, nuclear fallout almost always goes from west to east. And there's a lot more targets on the east coast. But anyway, if that happens, we're on the east coast and there's mass cities being targeted. we got to bug in because we have to wait for that fallout and stuff to go away. I've done a whole episode on radiation, nuclear war, and you. Again, another resource if you want it to understand how radiation works. We are... Again, I think pretty clearly in a second Cold War. So you may want to get reacquainted with those old civil defense films and how radiation works. The myths, the truth, the time duration, things that actually work and don't work. Anyway, those are the bug out indicators for my wife and I. And I will go over them pretty succinctly right now. Gas over $10 a gallon. Food shortage of basic items, not toilet paper. Civil unrest more than local and more than an acute situation. World War III actual. NATO or many other countries joining. And then finally, any city in the U.S. getting nuked. So those are our bug out indicators. If I missed one or you think you have a better one, I'd love to know about it. You can contact me via goodshepherdtraining.com or you can leave it in a review so everybody can see it. There's a bunch of other shows we've done on prepping and preparedness and food storage and water and preserving meat, all kinds of things. Go back and check those out. This is just strictly bug out indicators. This is not how to bug out. Again, there's other resources for that. Even on this channel, there's guns for civil unrest. There's all kinds of resources on here. But this is about bug out indicators. When do you bug out? And that doesn't mean you live your life in fear, right? Do I sound afraid? I have actually bugged out before. I have been to war a couple times. And I don't take any credit for my being able to speak to you right now. All that I have is by God's leave, meaning by God's grace. He allows me to. It's by his permission, by his divine providence. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, yet not one of them. And yet, not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all counted. Do not fear. You are more valuable than a great number of sparrows. Now I guess we could count that as a tactical verse of the day. In closing, I may say another one or two, I'm not sure. But I haven't yet given you the tactical tip of the day. Now an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. We've all heard that little colloquial saying. And that certainly rings true here. You don't want to get exposed to radiation. I think that goes without saying at least not high doses of radiation. You get exposed to doses of radiation every day. Just by being on the surface of the earth and the sun. You absorb some amount of radiation every day. But massive doses are bad. (laughs) I don't think I have to explain that. But there is something cheap and simple that can help remove radiation. And no, it's not potassium iodate like you might be thinking. That helps get radiation out of your thyroid. I do have some. I do keep it in the center console. I'm talking about pectin. The same kind of pectin, pectin you get if you're making jam or jellies or something like that. Jam or jelly usually will have pectin in it, obviously. But you can just buy straight pectin, and it's super cheap. It lasts a long time. You can put it in your pantry, and hopefully you never need it for that purpose. But pectin does help get radiation out of the body. Other sources, if you don't have straight pectin, if you know how to find wild currants, if you listen, you know that my wife and I are into foraging and getting our own wild food quite a bit. But currants, just find the currants. They're a good thing to know how to find and eat anyway. They're quite good. I don't know if all apple juice, depending on how it's processed, but apple juice can have pectin in it. Anyway, that's your tactical tip of the day. Now, some may theologically disagree with me bugging out and being prepared and things like that. I want to be clear. I 100% believe that God provides and my God supplies all my needs. I also know faith faith without works is dead. 
Think about this. God 100% certainly saved Noah and a remnant from total destruction of the earth. He saved them, yes. Did God build them an ark? Negative. Noah had to build the ark, right? He had to get his hands dirty. He had to prepare. He had to get ready. And he had to bug out with his family. God told him to watch and be ready, told him something was coming. God certainly took care of him. God certainly could have destroyed him too. But he had to build the ark. He had to get his hands. Well, let's just say he had to do stuff. And let's not forget about Paul, who wrote a big chunk of the New Testament. A mighty man of God. A great evangelist. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten. He was stoned. He had to bug out many times, flee for his life. Now that I'm thinking about that, David also, he had to flee. Even though he was anointed to be king, he had to flee for his life and hide in caves. If that's not bug out actual, I don't know what is. Anyway, in closing, thanks for listening and have a blessed day.